Thank you, Brother Rig. Appreciate that. Uh, appreciate the choir this morning. They're singing as well. Appreciate the congregation, your presence here this morning. It's always great to have somebody to preach to. I want to uh, let you know this morning we've got a lot of ground to cover, so we're going to get going uh, kind of in a hurry this morning. We are looking forward to Easter. Uh, next Sunday morning, I want to invite you to come out and join us for our sunrise service uh, 7 a.m., Brother Joseph Griffiths from uh, Mountain City Baptist Church will be joining us that morning. He'll be bringing a uh, resurrection message as we go up on the hill, uh, weather permitting, that morning. And I want you to come out and join us. There's going to be uh, a breakfast following, and uh, the uh, uh, we're going to join together in the Life Center at 7 o'clock that morning, walk up together on the hill. Always a great time of the Lord as we celebrate uh, the resurrection of our Savior. You know, uh, Paul said, if he be not risen, then our faith is in vain. So the resurrection means everything to our faith today. And as we think about next week being Easter, we certainly uh, want to talk maybe or, or get started on that theme. And I want to talk to you today about the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. About we sang the old rugged cross and what a great song that that is, but the cross maybe uh, is a symbol that most of us would recognize of the Christian faith has come to symbolize the Christian faith. And there's a lot of things about the cross that I think are very uh, maybe necessary for us to understand today. And I want to show you some of those things. I want to begin this morning in Mark chapter number 15. If you've got a Bible with you, I want you to go ahead and turn to Mark 15. We're going to start in verse number 15. We're going to read several verses. going to be going backwards and forwards. Of course, you know uh, the stories of, of, of the resurrection. Today, uh, we are celebrating Palm Sunday, and we're talking about the time leading up to the resurrection. We're going to begin uh, just a moment talking about the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, uh, before we do that, we want to go to the Lord in prayer. And for sake of time this morning, if you've got a special need on your heart, would you just raise your hand? Maybe it's somebody else. Maybe it's you. Maybe it's somebody in your family. Maybe there's a need that you know of. You just raise your hand. God knows all about it this morning. And we're going to do that by signifying or signify that by raising our hand. So the Lord sees those needs this morning. You can put them right back down. Let's pray together. Father, we do thank you for this opportunity to be here in this place. Lord, we realize that other than the fact that this place has been set aside for service unto you, God, there's nothing special about the bricks or the mortar, nothing special uh, about the wood or the carpet. But God, we know that this is a place where you've met with your people in the past. God, we realize that the church really is the body. It's those, it, those believers this morning that are standing here in our midst. And Father, I pray as we join together, God, I realize there, there are many personalities in the room this morning. Lord, there are many problems that may be represented here in the room this morning. There are many that are struggling with heartaches, having hardships and, and hard times in this room. But God, I know this morning that you're able to meet every need according to your riches and glory. Father, I pray this morning that you may touch us, God, that we may see a little bit of heaven this morning. God, if there's one here lost among us, God, I pray this morning they may even feel a little bit of hell. God, maybe you would shake them up. Maybe Maybe you would show them the reality of the decision that they need to make for the Lord Jesus Christ this morning. God, we know that time is short. And I pray, God, you'd help me to preach like that this morning. Lord, like you might come back even before we begin, uh, even before we end this service, Lord, you may appear. And I pray that each one would have that on his heart, on his mind. God, I pray we'd be ready to receive you or ready to be received by you this morning. Lord, that none of us would would be found ashamed at your coming. God, if there's even one loss, would you touch them? God, would you save them? Would you reach down and help them? God, there are some here this morning struggling with things they don't know anything about. Would you bring comfort? Lord, would you bring encouragement for those that might need it this morning? Father, we pray most of all that Christ might be honored. Lord, that He might be glorified. And Father, that we'd dwell upon the things that you would have to say to us this morning that would be ready as we go throughout uh, this holy week this week. God, as we think about the resurrection, Father, may we be quick to praise you 
for what you've done for us. God, may we share with our friends and our families, Lord, in this community, in the world, what Christ has done. Lord, we're not celebrating the Easter Bunny this week, but we're celebrating the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. May we live like that every day. Father, we thank you so much for the promises that you've given us in Him. We ask you to bless this, this service and these people in Christ's precious name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. I was going to say you may be seated, but you can stand up. We're going to read the Scripture. Read this morning, Mark chapter number 15. And we're going to begin in verse number 15. The Bible said, And so Pilate, willing to content the people, released Barabbas unto them and delivered Jesus when he had scourged him to be crucified. And the soldiers led him away to the hall called Praetorium, and they called together the whole band. And they clothed them with purple and planted a corn of thorns and put it about his head. And began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews. And they smote him on the head with a reed and did spit upon him, and bowing their knees, worshipped him. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple from him and put his own clothes on him and led him out to crucify him. And they compelled one Simon, a Cyrenian who passed by, uh, coming out of the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to bear his cross. And they bring him to the place Golgotha, which is being interpreted the place of a skull, and they gave him what they gave they gave him to drink wine mingled with myrrh, but he received it not. And when they had crucified him, they parted his garments, casting lots upon them, what every man should take. And it was the third hour, and they crucified him. And when they had crucified him, they parted his garments, casting lots upon them, uh, what every man should take. And it was the third hour, and they crucified him. And the, the superscription of this accusation was written over the king of the Jews. And with him they crucified two thieves, the one on his right hand, the other on his left. And the scripture was fulfilled which saith, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and they, they that passed by railed on him, wagging their heads and saying, Ah, thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself and come down from the cross. Likewise also the chief priests mocking, said among themselves uh, uh, with the scribes, He saved others himself he cannot save. Let Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross that we may see and believe. And they that were crucified with Him reviled Him. When the sixth hour was come, about noon, when the sixth hour was come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour, about three o'clock in the afternoon. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried uh, with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is being interpreted, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And some of them that stood by, when they heard it, said, Behold, he calleth Elijah. And one ran and filled a sponge full of vinegar, and put it on a reed, and gave him to drink, saying, Let alone, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus cried with a loud voice, and gave up the ghost. And the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. And when the centurion which stood over against him, saw that he so cried out and gave up the ghost. He said, Truly, this man was the Son of God. There were also women looking on afar off, among whom was Mary Magdalene, and Mary the mother of James the less, and of Joseph and Salome, who also, when he was in Galilee, followed him and ministered unto him, and many other women which came up with him, unto Jerusalem. You may be seated this morning. We have a lot of ground to cover this morning. We're going to continue on this course tonight. Uh, Lord willing, there 
I want to show you some portraits, some pictures, maybe some snapshots of the cross this morning. Uh, some things that I want us to look into. We'll in no wise exhaust this scripture, but we need to understand a lot about the cross because that gives us, that sheds light on the resurrection and its importance. Now, this morning we don't have a lot of extra time, so if you don't mind, I'll just cut out the jokes and we'll just go right to the scripture. I want to show you first this morning uh, the conspiracy leading to the cross. We've got to understand what's happened in the past if we're to see where we are right now as Jesus Friday morning is on the way to the cross. We're going to examine just a little bit some of the things that have led up to the cross. Now, what is the purpose of this conspiracy? Well, I think number one, we may have to look at the people of this conspiracy. There are a lot of folks involved in getting Christ to the cross, right? We know that the the Jews conspired against Jesus. We know uh, that Annas and, and Caiaphas, the high priest, and uh, we know that the Sanhedrin, that, that was the council of the scribes, the priests, the Pharisees, uh, the Sadducees, all those religious leaders. There were 72 members that made up that Jewish council, counting the high priest himself. Caiaphas being the high priest and Annas being a former high priest and also the father-in-law to Caiaphas. He was really the power behind the power uh, that uh, pulled the strings as it were Caiaphas was more of just a puppet. He was placed in charge by the Roman government. So these men were not placed in a position of religious importance because uh, of their merit, because, uh, because of their character but they were put there because the Roman government placed them in charge. Now we know that they held a very powerful position and they wanted to keep that position. As we think about these these men, these Jews, Annas, Caiaphas, uh, the Jews himself, the Sanhedrin, all these men wanted a way with Jesus. They're involved in the conspiracy. Now, there was also one of Jesus' own. You remember uh, the Bible tells us that there was one of the twelve, right? The twelve in the inner circle of Jesus. Jesus, his name was Judas Iscariot. You, you remember him? And the Lord said, he said, I've chosen you, and I'm paraphrasing here, and he said, one of you is a devil. Jesus knew all along that Judas would betray him. Jesus knew all along who it should be that would betray him. But Judas, uh, the Bible teaches us that none of the other disciples recognized that it was Judas that would be the one to betray Jesus. Even when Jesus told them that, they didn't know. When Jesus sent him out, they supposed that he might have been going to, to secure some of the much needed things for the Passover because he was a treasure. He was the one that everybody trusted. He, he, he wasn't the Galilean. He was the, of the tribe of Judah. He was the most trusted. He had a, a background. He had a pedigree as it were. He would have been the least likely suspected. Yet he sold Jesus for what he could get. He took him for 30 pieces of silver. I believe that Judas was always in it for what Judas could get out of it. Now, there are a lot of Christians like that today that come to church that come because of what they can get out of it. They come maybe to be seen. They come maybe to make business contacts. They come so the world will think that they're a fine Christian. Well, that's what Judas was. He was, he was one thing, but he was pretending to be something else. He was a great pretender. And once he realized that Jesus wasn't going to go in and take the kingdom by force, that in fact Jesus was going to die, that's when he quickly abandoned Jesus. All his hopes that he had pinned on Jesus had left him. He thought that if Jesus rose to the top, that he'd be next to the man that was in control. That he'd be his right hand man. That he would have authority and he would have possessions. But once he saw that that, that hope was gone, he sold Christ for what he could get out of him. He sold him to the Jews for 30 pieces of silver. These men were involved in a conspiracy they were the people of the conspiracy, but also uh, you find here the reason, not, not only uh, the people, but the purpose of the conspiracy. You, you find that the Jews wanted to get rid of Jesus. Why? Because they were envious of Him. Even Pilate himself, the Bible says that Pilate knew that it was for envy that the Jews delivered Him. They were afraid to lose their place. They, the Bible says they were afraid when they consulted among themselves, they were 
were afraid that because of the miracles Jesus did and the way that he preached and taught with power and authority that all the people would come to him and leave them behind or that, that Rome might hear that they had lost their control on the people and they would be taken out of a place of authority and they would no longer have their position. They would no longer have their wealth. They would no longer have their influence. So there was a conspiracy to get rid of Jesus. Jesus has got to go. I tell you in America today, there seems to be a conspiracy to get rid of Jesus because folks are threatened by the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. When you talk about God, people are accepting of God. But when you talk about Christ being one Lord and being the Lord of your life and Him being the only way, you find quickly that there are dividing lines and folks don't want to hear that because they want to live the way that they want to live. Just like the Jews did. They wanted what they wanted. They didn't want to lose what they had. And folks today don't want to lose their grip on life so they don't want to accept Jesus for who He really is. So you see, the purpose here was to get rid of Jesus. But there was also a secondary purpose. If you'll study the Scriptures in context, if you'll, if you'll look at Acts chapter number 2, the Bible says, Ye men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by Him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. Now listen to this. He says, Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. So the Jews and Judas thought that they were getting rid of Jesus. They thought that, it, that, that He was going to be over once they, they crucified Him. Everybody else would be scattered. Nobody would follow Christ's teachings anymore. They were going to get rid of Him. They, they were going to do away with Him, but they didn't realize that they were falling in, that God was using their plan as His plan. God was using wickedness to bring good. It was God's determination permanent foreknowledge to give Christ that you and I might have life and they were being used as it were just as pawns they, they thought that they were doing their own will they thought that they were having their own way but listen God was using this for my good and your good His determinate foreknowledge you see God did it for His purpose that was the purpose that was the purpose. You, you see here, now, now not only the purpose and the people involved in the conspiracy, but, but also the portrayal of this conspiracy. There, there were several aspects involved. Do you know that there were, were six separate hearings involved in, in, the, in Jesus' trial? Did you know that? First, when they, they came to the, to the Garden of Gethsemane. You remember there when Jesus was praying. The Bible says He was agonizing and He was encouraging His disciples. He told them to watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. Remember, he'd go a stone's cast away and he'd get on his knees and he'd pray. And he said, Father, if it be possible if his cup pass from me, nevertheless, not as I will, but as but thy will be done. Then he'd go back, go, 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 go to his three or his, or his six, and they'd be there asleep. They'd be there already falling asleep. They had fallen into temptation. They weren't watching, they weren't praying. Christ knew what was coming. Coming, but they had no idea exactly what was going to happen yet. So we find that when Judas came, we, if we'll read over the scripture a little bit, uh, we'll find that when Judas came, he had a band of soldiers from the high priest with him. When he came in, he said he had told them ahead of time, this is a way that you'll know who Jesus is. I'll go in there and I'll give him a kiss. And he, he went in to identify Jesus, embrace Jesus, and Jesus entreated him as a friend. He said to him, friend. He said to him, friend. When he kissed him there, and Christ knew, Christ knew that he had betrayed him. But yet he gave him one more chance. He gave him one more chance to repent. He knew he wouldn't do it. But he gave him one more chance to repent right there when he sold him out. And then those soldiers come forward. They said, uh, ask who Jesus was. And Jesus said, it's me. And it shocked them so much so that they fell, as it were, on their backs. They didn't expect him. They expected a fight. They expected maybe that he would run. And certainly they were not disappointed at Peter as Peter drew a sword out and chopped off the ear of one of the high priest's servants. But, but Jesus touched the high priest, put his 
ear back and told Peter, he, 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 he rebuked Peter. He said, those that live by the sword, die by the sword. You see, Jesus could have called angels from heaven, but he knew that it was God's will that he go to that cross. It was God's will that he be sold out that you and I might have eternal life. Then he was taken from there. He was taken to the household of Annas, the high priest, uh, father-in-law, who used to be the high priest. He was, he was uh, shown before him. He was taken there to Caiaphas. He appeared before him. And, and then uh, they, uh, they heard him there as well. Then they got the whole Sanhedrin together. And they, the 72 members, they decided that he was guilty. But the truth is they couldn't do what they wanted to. Because it wasn't, it wasn't legal for them to put a man to death. It wasn't legal for them to kill a man. And after all, they had to get rid of Jesus. He, he had to be gone. He couldn't just be in prison. They wanted him dead. They wanted to kill him. They wanted to make sure that they made a public statement. They wanted Jesus dead. So what did they do? Well, then they sent him to Pilate. They, they, they sent him out to Pilate, and Pilate, Pilate couldn't find any fault in him. He couldn't find any reason uh, to, to pronounce a guilty sentence on him. And he, he asked the Jews, and, and, and the Jews said, Well, we can't, we can't put him to death. And, and Pilate found out that he was a Galilean, and he, he knew that Herod, Herod was in town. And he said, Well, send him over to Herod and let, let Herod judge him. So Pilate tried to get out of it. Why? Because Pilate had had a dream. Or Pilate's wife had had a dream. And Pilate's wife had, had in this dream. And she had warned Pontius Pilate. She said, don't have anything to do with this just man. I'm paraphrasing here. But he was a little bit afraid. He knew of the miracles that Christ had done. And, and to be honest with you, I think Pilate really wanted to let him go. He, he tried over and over to let him go. But the Jews insisted. He sent him to Herod. And Herod did nothing. But all he wanted to do was see some miracle. He desired to see a miracle and he made fun of Jesus. He mocked Jesus. He sent Christ away uh, as some, some kind of a, uh, made sport at him as, as some kind of a, a fool. He sent, he sent Christ back and Pilate had to see him again. Pilate had to see him again. And, and then he scourged him. Pilate, Pilate had him beaten. Now, you, you know about all that. You, you know that in the Garden of Eden or in the Garden of Gethsemane that uh, he sweat, the Bible says, as it were, there great drops of blood. He agonized over sin there in the garden to the point where the capillaries burst in his body and caused his sweat to mingle with blood. A near perfect body. He agonized there in that garden over the, to the point where he was nearly dead. And that would have made his whole body like a bruise. I've told you this before. You've heard other preachers maybe talk about this. It's a, a medical condition known as hematidrosis. It's a very real thing. And it's a very painful thing. If you were to have that, it would hurt, Brother Tyler, just to, to lay my hand on you. But, but Jesus had already been through this. And then they took him and scourged him. And you, you know what that entails. They probably hung him around some kind of a tree, some kind of a, a stump maybe, chained him there, tied him there, and they would have beaten him probably... Uh, with reeds and then they would have taken the, the cat of nine tails uh, the long strip of leather attached to a, a handle and then on the end of that there would have been some maybe some lead balls there maybe would have been some sheep bones there uh, sharp instruments maybe maybe even glass and then there would have been one soldier on one side and one on the other as he was most likely bent or kneeling in this position they would trade legs one would hit one side and one the other and they knew what they were doing and they laughed at him the whole time as they beat our Savior there and they knew how to flick their wrists and inflict the maximum damage upon his back, upon his legs, upon his body and they ripped the flesh from him there, the blood of our Savior pouring down into the ground there and made fun of him, made sport of him. How he suffered. How he suffered. And then, I'm not going to go very far in that, you know how he physically suffered, but once that suffering was over, Pilate brought him back before the Jews as if to say, as if to say, look at the man. You call him a king. You, you say that he's king. This is a joke. This, this man, look at him. He's nearly dead. He's nearly dead. And yet you demand that I let him go. That's, that's basically was Pilate's attitude, I believe. Then, then uh, 
Pilate said, you, 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 I'm paraphrasing, he said, you have a tradition that I release one to you at the Passover. He said, we have here uh, Barabbas, who the Bible says he was, a, he was a thief, he was a robber, but he was convicted, he was guilty of death, which leads you to believe that they, they didn't uh, convict thieves, they, they didn't sentence them to death, so he must have killed somebody involved in the crime. And pro- no, doubt, no, no doubt the two thieves that were on each side of Jesus were his cohorts. And, and Pilate said, we have here Barabbas, he said, and we have Jesus, who should I, who should I release to you? And he asked them, and they, they cried out for Barabbas, a murderer, to be released. And they let, let the Lord of, of glory, they, they, they shouted, crucify him. They shouted, crucify him. Same crowd, just a few, just five days before, same crowd that Clint read this morning was laying down palm leaves in the way, and they were shouting, bless it. Hosanna in the highest. They were welcoming him as a king. And just five days later, they were shouting, crucify him. You see, the Jews had stirred up the crowds against Jesus. And he was very nearly dead at this point. I don't know that a man, a normal man, I heard one preacher say lately, he, he thought Jesus was the strongest man that ever lived. I'd never, I'd never considered that. But I believe he might be right because Jesus, outside of Adam, is the only man that never lived, that ever lived without a sin nature. He had a perfect body. He had what our, our body was meant to be. And that perfect body was beaten. That perfect body was bruised nearly to the point of death there. And these people still shouted, it's not enough. Crucify him. You see, it was illegal the way they tried him. They tried him at night. Wasn't supposed to do that. They, they also convicted him on his own testimony. They hired some liars to come in. The Bible teaches, if you read it in context, hired some false witnesses, Tommy, to come in there and lie about him. But their witnesses, they wouldn't agree one with another. And he couldn't nobody speak evil of him. So they finally tried to trap him in his own words, got him to admit that he is God, and then convict him of being blasphemous. So that's why they, that's how they justified killing him. You see, that's all leading up to the cross. Now, we see the conspiracy here. I'm sorry, you're going to have to bear with me a minute. The conspiracy leading to the cross, but also the, the cruelty of the cross itself. Now, we talked about how he's been beaten, probably nearly beyond recognition. And now he's made to carry this cross. Probably Jesus, he'd been up praying all night, hadn't he? he? He'd prayed to the time they come and got him out of the garden. So he hadn't slept, had he? So he was exhausted. Most likely hadn't had anything to drink since the night before when they shared the Last Supper together. Most likely was dehydrated. He'd been beaten and and the blood loss with the dehydration. His body had probably gone into shock. He was exhausted. And now he's forced to carry this cross. We think about most of the most of the pictures that we see, he's carrying the entire cross. I, I don't I don't guess it really matters that much, but I don't think he was carrying maybe the whole cross, maybe just a cross member that he, his hands would be nailed to. Estimates are between 75 and 125 pounds that he had to carry that. And nobody really knows how far it was to Gal- Gal- Galgotha's Hill from the Praetorium. Uh, some people speculate that it was somewhere around a half a mile. Some say maybe around a mile. But it was a pretty good clip from the Praetorium up to Galgotha's Hill. For a man in his condition. For a man in his state. So much so that he couldn't carry that. That they had to compel Simon the Cyrenian. The Bible says to help him to bear that cross. He had to, he had to have help. And then once they got there. Then, then, then once they got there. His physical suffering continued. As they would have laid him down on that cross. And placed that cross together. And, and took those spikes and and driven into his 
driven into his body. They would have taken his, his wrist. And most of the time we see in the palms. I, I don't believe that's probably not correct. It was probably here. Uh, but that's not worth arguing about. Here would not be enough to support a 180, 200 pound man. It would probably rip them loose. So it was more than likely here through between these two bones, if I understand the hand correctly, uh, between these two bones, they drove the spike and, and would have hit that major nerve that runs up, which searing pain would, would begin to shoot up to his neck and down through his back and all through his body as they drove that spike, as they drove that in and the blood began to spurt on each side as they pulled his arms out tight, drove those in as they put the block of wood in the bottom of the cross that would help him to, to push up. See, see, it wasn't enough just to hang on the cross. They, they had to make it even more cruel. You see, if they hadn't put the block of wood for him to be able to push up a little bit, he wouldn't have been able to exhale at all, which means he would have died very soon from, from carbon monoxide poisoning. So they put that there so he could push up so the agony would last longer. So, so it would be even more cruel. And they would have placed his feet together on top of that block of wood, bent his knees just a little bit so he could move, and then drove the final spike through both of, uh, both of his feet or, or right through here, maybe about the ankle through both of those and put him on that cross. And you think about the physical cruelty as they picked that cross up and let the cross slide down and <laughs> crash down into that hole and the searing pain that would have engulfed his body. And we think about physical pain because we can identify with that. But you know what I'm going to say next. The physical pain, he was nothing compared to the spiritual pain. He was nothing compared to the spiritual thing. The, the one thing that Christ didn't know didn't understand was sin. He never knew what it felt like to be a sinner. And you know what? He took every lie I ever told. He took every sin I ever committed. He took every sin that you ever committed. Our lies. Our, our thievery. Our disobedience. Our rebellion. Our adultery. Our murderous thoughts. He took them all. The Bible says he bore our sin in his body on that tree. You know why he was agonizing in that garden, don't you? It wasn't because he was worried about the physical pain. I guarantee you that. Listen, Jesus knew he was going to have to die. But when he said, Lord, when he said, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me, what he was talking about was the wrath of God. You see, he took the wrath of God that I deserved. For being a liar, for being a murderer, for being a fornicator, for being an adulterer, whatever that may be. He took the wrath that I deserved. And God poured his wrath out upon him there on that cross for you and for me. We'll talk about that a little bit more. How that he satisfied the wrath of God. But that's the cruelty. Of the cross. And he was willing to do that. For you. And he was willing to do that. For me. Now I want to share with you one more thing. Before we leave. You see. All the while. While Christ was suffering. There was a crowd. That was gathered around him. And in that crowd. There were several groups of people. You find in this crowd the wicked warriors. You find the, the, the centurion that's there in charge of the crucifixion. You find the soldiers that physically beat him. And the, the ones that drove him to the cross. The ones that uh, nailed him to the cross. The ones that suspended him in the air. And they're very wicked because they were making fun of them. Him. The whole time. They had spit upon him. They had plucked his beard. They had slapped him. They had hit him. They had put the, 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 the purple, they had put the robe on him to make fun of him. They would get down in front of him in, in, in mock worship. And then when they stood up, they would slap him. They would spit in his face and laugh at what kind of king that you could treat the way that they treated Jesus. And then they laughed at him on the cross as Jesus hung for their sins. And for my sin, those wicked men gambled 
at the foot of that cross for the one thing that he had that was worthwhile, his outer garment. They gambled that who might take that. So they gambled for that. Not only them, but you find <clears throat> verse number 29 tells us here, you, you find the wanton uh, you, you, you find the wanton watchers, it, it says, and they passed by, they that passed by railed on him, wagging their heads and saying, Ah, thou that destroyest the temple and builds in three days, save thyself and come down from the cross. What do you mean by wanton watchers? Well, I'm talking about the crowd that could never get enough. They, they could never get enough. They, they would go, uh, they, this is what they did. They would go and watch a crucifixion. They thought it to be entertainment. They thought it to be fun. That's how they passed their time. And they thought it was funny to laugh at a dying man who was completely innocent. You know, it, it really sticks out to me that I see very little compassion around the cross other than the compassion that flowed from Jesus. You see very little compassion around the cross. So you've got the the wicked warriors, the wanton watchers, you, you've got the wayward worshipers. Verse 31 says, <clears throat> Likewise also, also the chief priests, mocking said among themselves with the scribes, He saved others. He, 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 he cannot, him himself, himself he cannot save. So, uh, so you've, got, you, you've got there the wayward worshipers. They thought that they were worshiping God, yet they were mocking God there, the Savior that they said that they were looking for. They said, he saved others. He, 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 he cleansed lepers. He gave the blind their sight. He, he raised the dead. If he's God, let him come down from that cross and we'll, we'll worship him. You see, that's how they dismissed it. They'd already said that the way Jesus cleansed, or cleansed the, or cast out demons was by the prince of the demons, by Beelzebub himself, right? They'd already said that, and they considered this validation to their opinion that Jesus didn't come off that cross because if it was God, you couldn't keep him on that cross. So it must be that God was on their side and that he had some sort of a demon. That's how they validated it to themselves. But little did they know what kept Christ on that cross was not the nails that they had placed in his hands, was not the nails that they had placed in his feet, but what kept him on that cross was a love that he had in his heart for sinners, the love that he had in his heart that we ought to have for everyone around us. Instead of condemning folks, we need to share with them the love of Jesus. We need to do what he did. We need to love them enough that we lay down our life. You see, there was a crowd of people around. And in that crowd, there were some worshipers that thought they was worshiping God. There were some wicked warriors there. There were some wanton watchers, but there was also some wailing women. You see, there were some women that followed Jesus, that ministered to him. Now, the disciples, they, they'd fled pretty much except John. That's all you hear. John's the only one you really hear about from the cross, and he's there with Mary. He's there with Jesus' mother. But you find the Bible says these women stood afar off. I reckon they wouldn't let them get much closer, Brother Tyler, because they... If, if they could have had, they'd have been right there at his feet. They'd have been just as close. But they were afar off. And they were weeping at what was happening to Christ. Can you imagine if you had to watch your son endure such suffering? Endure such hatred? The people reviling him. You imagine the love that Mary must have had in her heart, the understanding that she must have had for what was happening. I don't know that she understood everything, but I believe she recognized Jesus for who he was, that he was a Savior. And it must have hurt those women to watch all that. Does it hurt you when, when you see people mistreat our Savior? When you see people run him down, make fun of him? It, ought, it should hurt. It should hurt. When I think about him, it does hurt. When I think about what he endured, and I think about them sorry Jews, I can't believe they did that. 
They might have been the instrument, but it was me and you put him there. It was my sin. I'm just as guilty that put him there. And he loves us so much that he was willing to endure all that. Yet many times we, he, he would hang on the cross between heaven and earth in front of all these wicked people and bleed and die for our sin. Yet we won't stand up at the workplace and tell people that Jesus is the only way. Yet we let people slip off into eternity and never share with them the love of Jesus. You see, we ought to be expressing the same love that Jesus had for us everywhere we go. You think about that. Greater love hath no man than this, and a man lay down his life for his friends. That's what our Savior did on that cross. He took the sins of the world, and now we can have life. And I'm thankful for that, and we need to share it with those around us.